few events can brag of winter circle celebrations over a 50-year span. The Daytona 200 can. That small, sweet spot has seen the world's greatest motorcycle athletes celebrate with champagne and no few tears. From the 30s to the 90s, a win at Daytona is unmatched to the two-wheeled universe. ago, the latest and some say greatest chapter in Daytona 200 history was written when a young kid from Georgia named Scott Russell parked his Kawasaki on Doug Bowen's rear fender and drafted his way to victory at a record pace. Then, two years later, the Chief decided to make things a little more challenging by starting at the back of the pack before picking off 60-odd rivals on the way to a brilliant Daytona victory number two. What to do for an encore? How about taking the pole position, then low siding his Kawasaki going into the International Order Show on lap two, only to remount and then smoke the finest field in recent memory. Today, number four graces a factory Suzuki, and will this new ride make Scott the first to capture win number four? Welcome to Daytona Beach for the 55th running of the Daytona 200 by a ride. Rains here a week ago postponed this event until today. But the track is dried out and America's most prestigious motorcycle race is about to begin under ideal weather conditions. Here's 90 Daytona winner Dave Sadowski. Well, guys, it's been a year and one week since the competitors have had a chance to take a green flag for the Daytona 200. After a one-week rain delay, these guys are ready to get it on. I'm ready. I'm ready to go home. I haven't been home for two days and two months. I'm ready to go home, win this thing, and get out of here. Yeah, I went home on Monday, and I tell you, it's been a real mental game. You know, I'm at home, and I'm away from the racetrack, but I knew I couldn't lose focus of the race, so I just thought about it all week long, and uh, today I'm here. We're ready to go. My crew's ready, so I'm psyched. Luckily, today we got good weather, and now I'm ready to go race, and we've got our qualifying in and ready to go. I got to get out of here quick. I mean, the dog track's bleeding me dry. <laughs> Miguel, drafting doesn't work in dog racing. Let's go up top to Ralph Shaheen and Steve Evans for the race call. Thank you, Dave. Folks, I can't tell you how good this Florida sunshine feels. One week ago, a rogue storm came off the Atlantic so fast they didn't have time to name it and dump five inches of rain on Daytona International Speedway. But we're back a week late, but we're back. And, Ralph, I think the wait has just intensified the anticipation. Besides Russell, more history could be made. You're right, Steve. You know, we've got two Ducatis on the front row. No Ducati has ever won this race. We've got two Australians on the front row. No Australian has ever won this race. And then you got the story of Scott Russell. One way or the other, we're going to make history here this year at the Daytona 200 by a ride. Speaking of Australians, let's say good day, Mike, to the pole sitter with Dave Sadowski. Troy, I was out in the bleachers at the uh, dog leg sitting next to your mom when you set that time, and, and I asked her, is that going to be a ladies' Rolex? And she said, I don't know, I hope so. <laughs> How'd it go in those conditions? That was pretty spectacular. Yeah, of course, uh, it was a lot more difficult with that headwind down the front chute, but it was a, a fairly strong tailwind down the back straight, so uh, made it quite interesting getting into that back chicane a few times. Obviously, you know yourself how fast you get in there, especially with the tailwind, so uh, I feel I could have went a little bit quicker maybe even than the time I'd done, but uh, we'll wait and see what happens. I was happy enough. So Corser wins the Rolex watch for his first Daytona pole. But the big news at the World Center of Racing is this man, Scott Russell, and his quest for a fourth 200 win. No one has won more than three Daytona 200s. Now, Russell spent this week buying an exotic Porsche and waiting for what some say is his destiny. He's down with Dave Sadowski in the garage area. Has the week uh, helped the crew to find any tricks to get a little more speed to run that Ducati down? Yeah, I think we got it covered. You know, I think... Uh, the last day of qualifying, I think we had them covered. So um, hopefully the temperature's good today. The tires will be working good. The bike's running good. Let's just hope it works out for us. All right, you going to hold your breath the whole second lap this year? <laughs> you know I am. <laughs> Final adjustments are being made to the bikes. The riders are getting their leathers on. When we come back, a look at the field for the Daytona 200. TNN's exclusive coverage of the Daytona 200 is brought to you by Kawasaki Motorcycles. Call 1-800-661-RIDE for a dealer near you.
The new Kawasaki Vulcan 1500 Classic, with the biggest V-twin ever to hit the asphalt, you've never felt anything like it. Welcome back to the Daytona 200 by a ride, take two. Scott Russell, the other competitors are stretching out, and fortunately, today we need the umbrellas for the sun, not the rain. The start of this race is just moments away. Let's have a look at the most challenging course in motorcycle road racing. The first running of the Daytona 200 back in 1937 was held over on the beach. But in 1961, the race moved to the speedway and after several layout changes, settled on its current 3.56 mile length. It's extremely challenging and we asked several top riders how they attacked the track. First, Mike Hale. You put it into turn one, you usually go just, just to the number one brake mark. You, you downshift down the low gear. You drift into turn one, the, the rear end sliding out. You come through turn one, rolling back on the throttle. The back end usually steps out across the paint line, back to the left by the Armco barrier and pit exit. Miguel Duhamel describes the infield section of the course, starting with the International Horseshoe. You can lean into the right with a lot of confidence and, uh, and try to get a really good drive out of there for that little short shoot going through the infamous dog leg. And uh, through there again, you've got to be a little careful because then you go to the left-hand side. Usually a good corner for high-speed sliding. And then you go to the second horseshoe, which is again a tight right-hander. Come out again, there's a little short shoot before uh, you go out to the left-hand corner, which would be going out to the banking. Doug Chandler knows the importance of a quick entrance out onto the banking and back straight. You come out of the infield corner, I tend to shift into second a bit earlier just to kind of help me up on the bank and prevent a lot of wheel spin. And um, once you get up there, you keep yourself between the white line and the wall and just shift at your shifty points on the tackle and stay behind the fairing the best you can and you know get a good run off the bank and down the back straight. We reach about 175, you know, with a good run. Going quickly through the back straight chicane takes experience like Scott Russell's. So coming in, you got to back at the third, and I keep it as high up on the wall as I can to the last pop a minute. Turn it hard up on the big track. After that, it's simple. You just flick it through there in, in third gear, roll it on nice and smooth, and accelerate up to the right, left on the exit. Finally, Tom Kipp knows that a high-speed run on the banking after the chicane is the ultimate key at Daytona. The tire tends to slide quite a bit through NASCAR 4. There's a couple of big bumps. When you come across the travel, you want to be low and inside as much as you can. It's the shortest way around the, the banking, and um, that's the key. Did Scott Russell actually use the word easy to describe this course? Yep, I think he did. Well, you can't tell the players without a program, and since we were here a year ago, a lot of writers have found new teams and new marks to race for. Let's check it out. In addition to Russell, the Suzuki mark is deep in talent in 96, as their lineup also includes Pascal Picot, Australian champion Matt Milladen, and Aaron Yates. Picot joins Russell as escapees from the Muzzy Kawasaki team, with the Yates moving up from the 750cc Super Sport class. Last year at Kawasaki, Russell and Picot were partnered by Steve Crevier and Anthony Gobert. But for 96, only Gobert remains, now joined by Mike Smith and Doug Chandler. A winner in World Superbike, Gobert led for a while here last year, while Chandler rejoins the team that carried him to the 1990 AMA Superbike Championship. Smith, winless in Superbikes, would like nothing better than to get his first here at Daytona. In 1995, Smith was part of the Ducati effort, along with Fast by Ferracci teammate Freddie Spencer, the Pro Motor Team's Troy Corser, and world champion Carl Fogarty. This year, the Italian makes hopes rest again on Courser and former Honda rider Mike Hale. Courser is, of course, the 1994 AMA Superbike champion with Ferracci, while Hale arrives fresh from two wins and a 1995 series runner-up aboard a Honda. In 1995, the Smoke and Joe's Hondas of Mike Hale and teammate Miguel Duhamel dominated AMA Superbikes. And for 96, champion Duhamel returns, joined by Canadian compatriot Steve Crevier. Duhamel, who won here in 1991, is a strong contender for a second Daytona 200 crown. Both the factory and Banson Hein Yamaha teams return intact from their 1995 lineup. Jamie James is on a comeback from a 95 injury, while Tom Kipp is looking to improve on his sixth place finish here last year. 
factory rider Colin Edwards is a strong contender before his upcoming return to the World Superbike Wars. Finally, the Harley-Davidson effort has seen the departure of Doug Chandler, which elevates Chris Carr to the team leader role alongside Thomas Wilson. The ever-improving car will forgo the dirt tracks to devote his energies to the monster superbike, while Wilson steps up from a 750cc Supersport Kawasaki. If it's job security you're looking for, this may not be the career for you. Raul Shaheen joins me. Let's have a look at the grid, which has diminished slightly from the 80 start as we'd expected. Well, some of the guys couldn't return. Uh, budgetary reasons and so forth would not allow them to. But the first few rows, all the big dogs are back and right in their charting positions where they qualified just a week or so ago. Mike Smith will be on the inside of row number three. Larry Pagram, the fastest of the fast by Ferracci Bunch. Kirk McCarthy is one of the riders that we were hoping to see here. He will not be here. He is a member of the World Superbike Team. Him and his teammate, John Reynolds, there you see bike number 69, have testing commitments with Suzuki and the World Superbike Team as they get set to chase that crown throughout the season. They had to leave to go back to Europe. Even Scott Russell had a commitment to tire test uh, for his GP team, but somehow blew that off so he could hang around and try to win his fourth and play with his new Porsche. I think that's an indication as you take a look at the rest of the field as to how important this race is to Scott Russell and also to the factory Suzuki and the rest of the factory teams as well. Scott told me earlier this week, if I don't win Daytona this year, I'm coming back. I will get four before I retire. You're talking about factory teams. In some cases, you've got the U.S. Superbike factory team, the World Superbike factory team, and the case of Scott Russell, a one-off all-Japanese effort. That's exactly right, plus a whole host of privateer teams. A brand new Suzuki is a real popular motorcycle. Amongst most of the competitors in the field, they have the largest percentage of all the motorcycles in the Daytona 200 this year. Tire wear is always a big concern for these teams, and for this year's race, the Dunlop team has a new slick design to race on. Here again is Dave. Now, Daytona is a monster of a racetrack. Everybody knows that. It eats up man and machine, but what it also eats up is tires. Dunlop has designed a tire for the 96-200 with a dual compound. Hard on the left side of the tire for going around the banking. Most of the heat is generated in this area of the tire. But then for going through the horseshoes and chicane area, Dunlop has constructed the tire with a soft right side. This allows the riders to accelerate hard off the hairpin turns and out of the chicane and onto the bowl. Quite a revolution in tire design. It is indeed. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed our hors d'oeuvre. The main event, the Daytona 200 by Arai, is coming your way here on TNN. First time you see it, you'll say two words, and the first one is holy. You can't wait. Valkyrie, May 25th. Bonjour, class. Now, with the exception of that $5,000 Olin's front end on there, this bike may appear to be a YZF 750 Yamaha. But add to that a $50,000 computer telemetry system and this 150 horsepower, one of six in the country motor, the Vance & Hines Yamaha is quite a piece. With carburetors that tell the ignition system when to advance and retard, it makes it easier for the rider to ride. Quite different than the stock components. What racers call what this bike is made out of is unobtainium. These hand-built pieces come from the Japanese engineers overseas. They're sent over to America, and with some Yankee ingenuity, these bikes are built into two-wheeled rocket ships. Bottom line, awesome bike for an awesome race, the Daytona 200. And that is about to unfold. The siding lap is complete. This is the real thing. The flag is down for the Daytona 200 by a ride. The question in the next uh, hours will be answered. Can Scott Russell win number four? It's Mike Hale who jumps out to an early lead on bike number 23. The rider out of Texas leading here at Daytona as we go into the first couple of turns. This is the International Horseshoe, and that's Anthony Gobert who sits in second place. And here comes the second wave of riders. There's too many to all take the green flag at once, and it wouldn't be safe to boot. Courser rides in third. Gobert now moving to the outside on the big green Kawasaki. That's going to open the door for Courser to try to sneak to the bottom. Russell sits in fourth. Colin Edwards behind him, then Miguel Duhamel, and behind him comes Mike Smith. 
If you're not familiar with 96 Anthony Gobert, he's a past Australian superbike champion and is famous for his total abandon, a very aggressive style of riding that should be fun to watch. That's one rider who loves to slide that big rear wheel. And look at Courser now diving to the bottom side as they get the run down the back stretch. So Troy Courser on the Ducati, which is quite a bit bigger, 955 cc's compared to 750 for everything else. It gets an advantage because it's a two-valve bike. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Right now, here they come into the chicane. Out of the chicane, it's back up onto the banking. And a lot of the riders say that this is the trickiest section of the racetrack as far as getting around Daytona quickly. That's NASCAR turns three and four. Then they dive it down, and they'll get as low as they can to the white line. It brings back across the start-finish line here at Daytona. to the high side as they go back to the infield. And this is where everybody raises up to use their body as kind of an air brake going into the first turn of the road course. Look at the rear wheel dancing around on Gobert. You heard Mike Hale talking about it at the beginning of the race, how that rear wheel will dance as you slide through turns one and two and into the international horseshoe. This is determined to be a two-stop race for tires and fuel. I don't believe anybody can make it on uh, fewer than two, Ralph. No, there's no way, really, Steve. And, and they've gotten the pit stops down to a point where they can do it so quickly now in around 10 seconds or less that most of the riders will take advantage of it, come in, change tires, and fuel up. You can get your tires on almost as quickly now as you can get the fuel in. Watch Mike Hale on the 23. Watch the big rear tire as he gets the power of that Ducati to the ground. He's going to paint the racetrack all the way up the banking. And look what an animal this thing is to try to hold on to. That rear tire is spinning, trying to get a grip. Well, I'll tell you, that is a ferocious mount. Courser using the banking to pick up more speed as he runs it down the hill. Gobert will tuck right behind him to try to get the draft, but look at Courser working the draft off his teammate as they hug the wall all the way down to the chicane. So the Ducati is very impressive in the early going, but if you read the newspapers in Daytona, you'd have seen quotes from Scott Russell saying, these are time bombs. They qualified with trick motors and gumball tires. They won't go the distance. Here's the look at Mike Hale the last time as they came back onto the banking. Watch the big rear tire of the Ducati. He'll start leaving black marks. The bike at the very front as he gets on the power using all of the power out of that pro motor motor. As he comes up onto the banking, he's just going to repaint the asphalt with black stripes. And that obviously is wearing that tire, something he doesn't need to do this early on. Look at the suspension as he bottoms going through the bump there. There's a look at him back out front again. Colin Edwards has now moved up into third. It's going to be interesting to see how long that rear tire can hang on, Steve, because he is really working it hard. Of course, Mike Hale comes out of AMA dirt track racing, so he's not afraid to slide the motorcycle, but those Michelin tires can't hold up for that. They've got to get at least 20 laps per set of tire. And still, these riders are measuring each other. Not only their individual styles, but where the power is. Do they have better handling in the turns? Or are they better off on the banking for passing? One thing's for sure, the draft is almighty at Daytona. Colin Edwards uses it to his advantage. That's one of the factory Yamahas. It's not one of the Vance and Hines bikes. It's straight from Japan. Look at Gobert slide that Kawasaki into the chicane. That is impressive. He could be the Dale Earnhardt of international superbike racing. Anthony Gobert from Australia. He could be one of the greatest Australian dirt trackers, too, but you get him on an AMA mile the way he slides that motorcycle. He was entering the chicane at 180 miles an hour, almost at full lock. To put it into perspective, right here, they're going about five miles an hour slower than a Winston Cup car, about 185. You saw Gary Medley and the Muzzy crew watching as Gobert does battle with Colin Edwards and Mike Hale and back into turn number one. Hale from the outside goes from third to first. Oh, and a big high side for Hale. He comes all the way out of the seat. How on earth did he stay on that motorcycle? It was like a bucking Bronco or a bull. And he only fell back to fourth position in the field. Courser is your leader. Gobert and Colin Edwards come through. And Mike Hale survives an amazing moment here at Daytona. That is just an excellent way to separate your shoulder just from the handlebars one direction all the way to the other. Full lock instantly. There you see 
chase. Scott Russell and Miguel Duhamel giving chase. So we get set to go back up into the banking. Now watch Hale. He carried so much speed into the corner. He's trying to pull the bike back in. And that rear wheel dances on him. Now watch Colin Edwards in third. How good are super bike brakes? He stayed on that bike only because he ducked down to the left-hand side, the inside of the motorcycle. That's the only thing that prevented the high side. That's that battle for third continuing on as Russell now tries to draft past Hale. See how much lower Scott Russell runs on that white line? He says it gives him a much better run down here into turn number one. Colin Edwards inside of Gobert. These guys will be swapping the lead and positions all day long, Steve. They sure will. Four of 57 laps are in the book. Stay with us. A decade ago, Suzuki unleashed the original GSXR. It created a new category of motorcycles. Win after win, time after time. We never stopped refining. And now the time has come again. The all-new GSXR 750 is finally here. Because something this fast can't be rushed. Tough athlete's foot, cure it the way doctors do. With the same unbeatable medicine they prescribe time and again. It's in Prescription Strength Desinex. Nothing cures athlete's foot better. Prescription Strength Desinex with a doctor's cure. After I've forgotten all about us, the song remembers when. Trisha Yearwood, Mark Colley, and the band. The Road, TNN, Wednesday. We are back at Daytona, where number three, Troy Corser on the Ducati continues to lead. Here we see number one, Miguel Duhamel on the Honda, pushing his teammate from last year, Mike Hale, for that fifth spot. Hale now on a Ducati. Of course, Miguel Duhamel carries the number one plate because he is the reigning AMA Superbike champion. His uh, former teammate, Mike Hale, finished second to him in that championship fight last year. Had Mike Hale not gotten busted up the way he did in Loudoun last year, uh, that might have been reversed because Mike Hale was on his way to maybe winning the AMA Superbike title. And here is Scott Russell on the Lucky Strike Suzuki going down low in the banking, chasing Gobert for that third spot. And I think Russell's going to get it right here. Scott, Ooh, I don't know. Scott normally likes to be as close to the upper wall there coming down the back stretch as he can when he runs it into the chicane. He is an expert at this chicane. He has dissected this section of corners better than anybody in the field. Something that Scott Russell can do that few can as well, and that is get the bike upright quickly to get more contact patch where you can wick that throttle on. The sooner you get upright, the sooner you can drive. Watch how low Scott Russell will get to the white line as they come back into the trial. But remember, we talked about that a lap or so ago. Look at this. He is right on the white line. He will be lower than anybody else's. It allows him to run deeper into the turn. Corser, he is really falling in love with this Daytona Speedway. We have found, I think, over the last couple of years that most of the Australian riders really like this place. Gobert has dr been dreaming of this place ever since he left. So has Corser. But most of the European riders seem to struggle with getting acclimated to this place. Well, the English absolutely hate it. Yeah, which just ask Carl Fogarty, right? That's right. He didn't even come back this year, which is maybe why a Brit has never won in 55 years. They didn't like the beach either. Of course, they don't like much. There's a look at Anthony Gobert as he comes sweeping through the infield section, and Miguel now still pounding the backside of his former teammate. Miguel de Hamel may be pacing himself a bit, Ralph, and his rear tire, because he's just got oh, to We got a rider Whoa. off, and it's Mike Hale. Mike Hale, who led this race, has now put his Ducati over the bales and into the grass. The Texan trying to remount, hoping to get back in this thing. We saw Scott Russell win it after falling off. There it is again. It looks like he just went a little too deep into the turn, Steve. And he's got it tipped over, and it just washes out from under him. A little too much break. Well, poor Mike Hale has had a really rough week here at Daytona. He had water problems all week long with that Ducati. He really felt he should have had a run for the pole, but he didn't get his chance because he had to use his backup bike. And now he ends his day here on the ground. And what a textbook slide with his hands in the air to prevent injury. You young riders, when you look at the tape, study that one. So that leaves it to Troy Corser. 
for the factory Ducati effort. This is a Pro Motor Ducati team. This is a World Superbike team. And Courser and Mike Hale are going to crisscross the globe this year trying to win another World Superbike championship for Ducati. Number 45, Colin Edwards on that trick Yamaha we talked about at the top of the show. Look at this. Troy Courser on the all-dominant Ducati just got blown off the racetrack by the Yamaha. What's going on? Steve, I think all these guys are going to come up and challenge each other early on, just feel each other out, test each other a little bit. We even saw in some of the early time practice sessions that over this large three and a half mile racetrack, these guys, the top four or five riders, would only be four tenths of a second apart from each other. However, did you see Courser just look down at the instruments on the, uh, the front of the bike there? He might be developing a problem, too. And there could be a bit of a Courser curse here at Daytona for the young Australian. He had this thing in the sack last year and let it get away with mechanical problems. Well, he sure did, and uh, Troy really wants to win this one. You can see the speeds these guys carry in the banking. Troy came here during Michelin tire testing, and he actually blew past the chicane and ran it all the way around the racetrack and clocked into the speed trap 202 miles an hour on that Ducati. And talk about parity, five different marks in the top five here at Daytona. Back at the AMA Daytona 200 by a ride, and the pole sitter Troy Courser is back in front of the bright red Ducati, pushing Colin Edwards number 45 back to second, and Scott Russell on the new Trick Suzuki is third. Back into the chicane area, and that's Edwards just in front of Russell, getting set now to go back up onto the banking. Oh, and they run up onto the backside of a slower rider. Oh, and look at the tank slapper Russell's in. And how? about Colin Edwards. He kicks it. Rod Graves, the lapper, throwing a Texas tantrum. Unbelievable how they both survived that. Take a look at this. It's Rad Graves in the yellow leathers as he is up high, and Colin gets blocked up there. That's the normal faster line. That's why Colin was headed there. Russell sees it. He's trying to avoid it, and he gets in this wild tank slapper. And now look at Colin with the right foot. hi -ya! little karate move. You know, Scott Russell let the motorcycle kind of have its way. That's why he survived that, I think. Think Greaves got the message? I think he'll be down low next time. This was a huge problem for a lot of the really fast riders here. When you have 80 riders in a field like this, obviously not everybody in that 80 rider field is on the same level of a Troy Corser or a Scott Russell. So there's a lot of guys who are regional riders who have made their way down to Daytona to qualify for the 200 have made it into the field, but they're not nearly riding as fast as these guys. So closing speeds, especially going into the chicane, could be 40 miles an hour difference between the two. But Troy Corser still hangs on to the lead. That's your pass for fourth as Miguel Duhamel goes past Anthony Gobert. Duhamel won six AMA Superbike races in a row last year. And he is maybe the strongest physical specimen out there. I saw him win a race at Loudon in 100 degree heat and didn't break a sweat. Look at this, look at Gobert drop to the bottom. Why they sucked the paint right off of that guy, didn't they? What a move by Anthony Gobert. Some of that was drafting and a lot of it was just sheer tenacity. Colin Edwards to the pits. Colin Edwards pulled out of the draft and went into the pit, Stephen. We're only on about lap nine. This is very premature for a tire stop. If that's what it is, and uh, most likely that will be the situation that he is abusing that tire. Well, Colin is riding on the uh, Dunlop tires. They work around the slower rider. That's Gibbs on the 94. So it'll be interesting to see now how those Dunlops are holding up. We should check in with Dave Sadaski now. Folks, I told you at the top of the show that Daytona eats tires. This isn't supposed to happen on lap nine. Colin Edwards in for a front tire change. He's telling the crew here, hey, something's going on with the front end. I need some more preload. The front end just not holding the front tire where it should. Colin Edwards out with an unscheduled pit stop. You could also see, Steve, how they had the IndyCar-styled air jack that actually raised the bike up off the ground. They could pull the two tires off, get them back out. Of course, they're just sailing along right now. 
Troy and Mike Hale actually came over and tested here at Daytona on fast by Ferracci Ducatis and then went back to Italy and came back over here with the pro motorbikes. So that actually helped out the fast by Ferracci riders of Sean Higby and uh, Larry Pegram get used to these two rider setups. And speaking of Mike Hale, he will not rejoin the fight. A broken water pump casting on his Ducati and he's sitting on the wall, a spectator. We'll be back to Daytona right after this. It has a 937cc liquid-cooled 16-valve engine with straight intake tracks, adjustable suspension, and an ultra-rigid twin-tube diamond-type frame. Best of all, it's comfortable on any road. The Suzuki RF900R. Funded by Arai is brought to you by your Suzuki motorcycle and ATV dealers. Suzuki, the ride you've been waiting for. Well, things are pretty calm out there on Lake Lloyd, but they're pretty hot here in the racetrack. As we watch Troy Courser put another one of the slower riders a lap down. And an interesting situation setting up in the fight for second place between Anthony Gobert on the Kawasaki and Miguel Duhamel. There you see the yellow bike, number one, second in your picture, closing in on the banking. Both of these very aggressive riders, but Duhamel makes it look a little easier than Gobert. Not quite as obvious. On the outside of Gobert does Duhamel, this Honda's got more power than anyone thought. I think all through practice and qualifying, they ran a race set of Gilbert again, take second. That might have been one of the times when Miguel was just testing Anthony. You can see a little bit of a tire slide there, but one of the things Russell did during practice here was he tested all the other riders coming out of the chicane, trying to draft them back to the start-finish line to see what they have. It's pretty early in the race now to run yourself, you know, blazingly hot and then abuse your machine. And Miguel's smart enough to know that. He might have been testing Anthony there, knows that he can get him, and now he'll just pull back behind him and run with him. So Troy Corser still up front. That's the three, the red Ducati. Takes a look over his left shoulder. For all intents and purposes, this 200-miler is a sprint race. It's a sprint race in 20-lap segments. Yep. But they want to make sure that they're at least within sight of each other at the end of those 20-lap segments. You don't necessarily have to be leaving as Rob Muzzy watches Gobert go around again. You don't have to be leading at the end of a 20-lap segment, but you want to be within sight of the guy who is. Now, Gobert, I don't know how well he knows Miguel Duhamel, but Duhamel is a French-Canadian that loves to have fun on and off the racetrack. And, of course, he needs to win here to pay up over at the dog track, as he told us earlier. So a little incentive for Miguel. He's one of the funniest guys in the pit area. He loves music and movies, and he's an avid golfer as well. Grew up racing mini bikes in his basement of his father, his, his famous father, Yvonne Duhamel, with his brother Mario in the basement, big basement? Small motorcycles. Oh, that'll work. Here comes Duhamel. It looks like a replay of the previous lap as he goes right around Gobert. Gobert gets a little shimmy in his Kawasaki. Can you imagine holding on to that thing at 180 miles an hour through the tri was shaking like that? No. Boy, not a problem for those guys, though, is it? Of course, Miguel Duhamel did a season racing 500cc GP bikes as well. And to run a GP bike fast, you have to be smooth because it is by far the most vicious road racing motorcycle out there. So that's one of the reasons why Miguel is so much smoother now that he is back in AMA racing. And of course, he has owned the 600 series for a long time. A couple of years ago here at Daytona when Eddie Lawson came out of retirement for one race, which incidentally he won, he said after the GP bikes, these things were like Winnebago's until he went out and went 181 miles an hour. And he said, really fast Winnebago's. <laughs> Steady Eddie, unfortunately not with us this year. Boy, it'd be great to have him back, but he's an IndyCar driver now. I do, Mel. What boys? The movement. 
brakes on top of the motorcycle are very precise. They have really done a lot of ergonomic work to the gas tanks on these motorcycles. There's slots for your chin for when you're running down the back stretch like this, you can really tuck up behind that windscreen. There's slots on the sides of the tank so you can lock your knee up in there or grab it with the arm and help yank that big bike over as you go into the tight turns like the chicane here. And the most sculptured of all those tanks is on the Ducatis. The Honda's not bad either that uh, you see Miguel on the number one bike, but the Ducati tanks are works of art. You can display them in a case. I wouldn't mind displaying one in my garage, if you know what I mean. The whole motorcycle. Absolutely. <laughs> Gobert and Miguel, they're going to have a beer when this is all over and say, boy, was that a hood. There's that shake on that Muzzy Kawasaki. Anthony was a little frustrated here last year because he felt that Russell was by far the number one rider in the Muzzy camp and that he didn't get as much attention as did Scott Russell. And Anthony really felt he had every bit as good of a shot at winning. It was his first year at Daytona, but he was very, very quick. In fact, when Russell came over and tested, Anthony did not get to make that trip. However, when he got over here in regular practicing, he was right there and ready to go. This year, he feels the team's a little bit more behind him. He is their number one rider here. Do we feel that Scott Russell on that brand new GSXR 750 Suzuki is hanging back intentionally, just facing the tire? Well, that's a good question. There he is. He, as we said, he wants to be within sight of those top guys, and he is certainly right there. And he's not pushing the motorcycle as hard as these two are because they're swapping back and forth and doing all that. Gobert's bike was just evil up high on the banking at top speed. Now it's twitchy everywhere on the course, especially under braking. You gotta wonder. Remember, about 70% of the braking power is on the front of these motorcycles. There's two discs on the front and only one on the back. And if you've got a front tire that's a little bad, uh, you'll find it when you grab that brake lever. Oh, look at that for drafting, huh? Of course, the brake discs in AMA Superbikes are the steel discs, but the steel discs are so good now that the finding that the stopping power with the steel discs is every bit as good as it was with the carbon fiber. I think Miguel here on the twisty sections trying to give Gobert a bit of a riding lesson as he pulls away, handles a lapper perfectly. That was Ricky Orlando that went a lap down, a veteran of AMA Superbike Racing. Miguel running not quite as far down on the white line as we saw Scott Russell earlier, but definitely within the same range. And Miguel wanting to redeem himself after mechanical problems put him out very early last year. In fact, he finished, as you saw in the graphic, like 57. No problems for Corsa up front. Things looking pretty smooth for him. You know, we theorized that Anthony Gobert might be having a tire problem on that Kawasaki. He's in the pits, and Sadowski's right there. Number 96, Anthony Gobert, in on lap 16, going for front and rear tires. Splash of fuel, Gobert's ready to go. Eight second pit stop, fabulous pit stop by the Muzzy crew. Now you can be sure that the tire technicians will come over right away and take a look at those tires and start getting a reading on what's taking place with the tires on the Kawasaki. As Courser tips her over once again into the chicane. And Miguel Duhamel, Steve, is closing right up on the backside of the Superbike rider from Australia. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll have more from Daytona. Daytona, our coverage of the Daytona 200 by Arai continues. That is Miguel Duhamel, the number one Honda, trying to chase down the Ducati of Troy Corser for the lead. Where is Corser? Well, you just saw a little flash of red, and that was him. Back down into turn number one once again, and there you can see the differential between Corser and Miguel Duhamel. It's only about a second and a half or so. Right behind them is Scott Russell. And after just one lap, Gobert needs more help. Gobert back in. Takes on another splash of gas. Apparently a pretty serious problem with the front end of the motorcycle. They're inspecting the brake calipers right now. There must be a misalignment, the front end dragging. Some big problems for Anthony Gobert as the crew goes to work on the front end. To See if they can hurry up and get him back into the race. No problems for this guy right now. Miguel Duhamel on one of only two Hondas in the field. Steve Crevy mounted up on the other one. Having a good run right now. You know, Anthony Gobert's first visit to the pits was not indicative of anything because he put it maybe four or five laps early. Oh. Whoa, Purser. Big problem. 
problems for Troy Corser as he has a problem just as they get set to go up onto the banking once again. Corser's going to rejoin. Let's have another look at this. An amazing job by Troy Corser, even though he got off the racetrack. Now watch the front forks. They are completely collapsed. There's no travel left. He's that hard on braking. Now they rebound. Almost pitches him off the bike. And takes it off the course instead of crashing it into the hay bales. Smart riding. Very soft grass. He easily could have lost control. And the very similar thing happened to Mike Hale, who got off. That's just the difference between the experience level of these two guys. Boy, no problems as he just stays nice and composed and eases it back up onto the asphalt. He turns it towards the racetrack and gets it back up to speed. So that makes Miguel Duhamel the leader as he comes into the pits and he's claiming for front tires already. You can see that. Most of the riders taking the pit stops for the top teams as far down the race course as they could at the far end of pit lane. And this is a planned stop for Duhamel, exactly when they wanted to bring that machine in. Let's see when Scott Russell will follow. He has inherited the lead with the problems uh, from Corser and the pit stop from Duhamel. Now there is no pit road speed limit here like there would be in a NASCAR race. So on pit road, we were seeing speeds up over 170 miles an hour. Scott Russell's bike is getting a little twitchy. He may not be far from getting some rubber. <laughs> Was Russell waving to the crowd? Oh, he's on a beautiful Saturday afternoon ride, is he not? What I told you, when he comes to Daytona, boy, is he ever in his zone. What an attitude adjustment it is to get the lead for the first time today, huh? He's just cruising right now. We're, we're about to see a lot out of Scott Russell before this day is over. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of tire left on that bike, Ralph, really. Well, we're in that 20-lap region, so Scott Russell will probably be bringing that brand-new Suzuki down pit road any time now. And praying for one of those seven-second stops that the Japanese team did in practice. And remember that this crew that Russell has got with him as he goes to work on another one of the slower riders, that's Steve Cook, is not very experienced in doing that sort of thing. This is the only time they're working together. This is not his Grand Prix team. This is not a world superbike team, nor is it the Yoshimura team. It's straight out of the factory just for this race. And it was a bike that had never been tested in competition. Plenty of uh, laps, I'm sure, at, cor at courses in Japan and here, but had never been under the gun as Russell is putting it today. And in the pits, again, I'm sure a scheduled stop is Troy Corser. Let's go down to Dave Sadowski. Number three, Troy Corser, going into his pit. First scheduled stop for Troy Corser. Be a full service here. Front, rear tires, six gallons of fuel. Little problem getting the front wheel off, mounted it backwards. They switch it around, get it back in. Little bit of a delay for Troy Corser. You know, I think that front wheel was rolled up to the pit crew backwards. They assumed it was in the right direction and tried to jam it into the forks, and it won't go. Davide Tardazzi, the team manager for the Pro Motor crew, overlooking the efforts there as Russell dips her back down in once again. You know, he came over here to test this Suzuki at Daytona, and he wasn't sure when he first tested the bike whether or not he would actually ride the Daytona 200. But the bike didn't meet his standards, and he didn't think it was going to be competitive. He had it written in that he could back out of the deal this year while they got that motorcycle ready. Look at him swap down in between those two slower riders. He was so excited after three laps on this bike. He said, guys, make my hotel reservation. I am in. You got it. But as we thought earlier, Scott Russell's just about out of rubber, and he, too, is headed down pit road. Here's Dave. Number four, Scott Russell coming in for his first scheduled pit stop. Puts his hand in the air, showing the crew that his bike is in neutral. Up with the rear stand, hydraulic lift on the front. Surprised to see unscuffed slicks going on. Scott Russell out. Good stop. A little difficulty getting it into first gear. Scott Russell out with a pretty clean first pit stop. And as they say in NASCAR, he's out on sticker tars. <laughs> That's exactly right. He is out on sticker tires. Troy Corser is your leader. And Aaron Yates doing a nice job on his new Suzuki running it fit. Stay with us. 
We're back at Daytona and Scott Russell is back on the prowl. He and Troy Corser have both been in for planned tire and fuel stops. Corser is back in the lead, even though he did a little uh, gardening here in the grass in Daytona, but that's how confident and totally committed this guy is. What an effort today so far, Ralph Shaheen. Don't forget, of course, Troy Corser was the 1994 AMA Superbike champion on a Ducati. He won that title for Araldo Ferracci, the best supplier of pasta in the pit area, we might add. Mm -hmm. Big, huge favorite happening for those of us on the Diamond P crew when we make it to an AMA National. Troy Corser right now is needing all the carbohydrates he can get out of that pasta to hang on to the bike. Did you see the shakes it was going through, coming through the trioval and that is something that they really had to work on early in the week when they got down here to Daytona. He could not keep it wide open without white knuckling it all the way around through the banking. And mano a mano between Corser and Russell, I've been looking forward to it. Russell very vocal all during the week about how these Ducatis no longer deserve to have an advantage on engine size. They don't deserve it. They've caught up. It's unfair. Uh, anybody that would listen, he would tell them that story. Boy, he told it loudly, too, in the media center after the first round of qualifying. And Russell, one of the things he said was his reason for being slower in qualifying than the Ducatis was that he ran a race setup when he felt that these guys came out with race qualifying tires and qualifying motors as well. Russell's already got a Rolex. He's he's got got a, Troy's got one. He's got a couple from this place. <laughs> There's Russell, Duhamel, and Edwards. Oh, and a problem. The number 15 of Michael Taylor is down. And that has brought out at least a corner yellow, not a full course. Another Canadian rider. So he had a problem with the handlebars, trying to knock him back around. This is Corser cruising along. You want to get under the paint if you can as you go down that back stretch. That's how low you want to get. That's a good line, Ralph. You like that, Evans? I'll steal that by loud. I'm sure you will. Traffic holding up Troy Corser just a little bit. Colin Edwards at third, even though he had a tardy pit stop, is right back in this thing. Right up along the wall through the banking is where you want to be. And then as you come out of turn four, you dive it down. As steep as that banking is, 31 degrees here at Daytona, you want to use every inch of that hill to get a nice run down it and into the trioval. Really carry that speed. And we'll see a lot of passing, I'm sure, before the day's over, going into one. And it's usually who's the bravest, who's the last to break. Troy Curser, a man with a life plan that is working so far just perfectly. Here we see Miguel de Hamel in yellow on the Honda working the lucky strike Suzuki of Scott Russell. And that's really going to be a good battle, too, because there's lots of Daytona experience between those two riders. There is a combination of four Daytona 200 wins between them. Of course, Russell, one of only a couple of riders to have won this race three times. That list includes Brad Andrus, Dick Clamforth, Roger Riemann, and Kenny Roberts. What about Freddie Spencer? Freddie Spencer, old fast Freddie, only picked it up one time in 1985 on the hunt. Thank you, Mr. Stats. Continuing to execute beautifully around the lappers was Troy Corser, and here comes Scott Russell. He'll have to do the same thing. Miguel de Amel just sliding in like a shark. But you know, Steve, you're talking about that list there, and when you look at that list, it is incredibly stacked with some of the biggest names in two-wheel racing. So when a guy like Scott Russell gets his name added to the list, that's why it's so important to these guys. And that's why Troy Corser wants his name on that list so he can be there with guys like Freddie Spencer and Giacomo Agostini. And until you go down to the media center, as Ralph and I can do, you don't understand how important this race is internationally. I would say there is more media from overseas covering this event than there is collectively from the U.S. and Canada. Absolutely, and that's why it was so important to TNN to be able to come back after the rain out and get this thing on for everybody this week because it is the most prestigious motorcycle race in the world, and we're happy to be able to bring it to you. And Troy Corser is certainly happy to be here on that number three Ducati just sailing along. And so far, Scott Russell's predictions of doom haven't happened. They have worked really hard on the Ducati to get it ready as they go around the number 13 bike of Steve DeCamp. One of the things they knew they had a problem with was reliability. And the Ducati team spent probably as much, if not more time, than anybody else over here at Daytona testing with Corser and with Mike Hale. They had Araldo Ferracci and the Pro Motor crews were together 
testing these Ducatis, doing everything they could, getting ready for this race. And I think the difference between the rider on the three-bike, Troy Corsair, and his teammate, Mike Hale, who went down and out of this race, is that last year, Hale rode that Honda, and it had a more predictable and a more even power band. It wouldn't bite you quite like the 955cc Ducati will. He just needs a little more time with it. Russell, look how confident he is. He's just so relaxed. There's nothing tense about him when he's on top of that bike, looking around, taking the whole thing in, looking at the fans and watching the crowd, I think, as much as he's watching what's going on on the track. I think he spotted a pretty girl in the infield. He's having a good day. Courser making his way down the back stretch. No problems there, but problems for Mike Smith. <laughs> 68, Mike Smith in for his first scheduled stop after the crew had to put a new clutch in Mike Smith's bike. Everybody taking on front and rear tires and six gallons of fuel. A little bit of a delay here on the rear tire change. Smith keeping the motor running in neutral. Buzzy crew just doesn't have it today compared to the other teams. Well, you can see team manager Steve Johnson on the back side of the wall watching. Of course, Mike Smith, now a brother-in-law to Scott Russell, after marrying one of Scott's sisters. Probably wishing he'd get one of Scott Russell's motorcycles right now. Russell having no problems as he sails through the trial. Now he really is pretty to watch. will be leaving after the Daytona 200 by Orion, heading back overseas. They've got to do another round of tests before the season opening for the Grand Prix Tour, where he'll be teamed up once again with Daryl Beatty. And hopefully, maybe this year, he'll be able to pick up his first 500cc GP win. Troy Corser is going to go back overseas and run this Pro Motor Ducati on the World Superbike Tour, looking to win that championship. And he has really had a uh, set plan on how he wants his career to go, Steve, from Australia to the U.S. crown to the world crown, and he's even thinking maybe next year he'll be ready for the 500cc ranks as well. Well, one pressure that Corser and Russell do not have is going points towards the AMA 96 Superbike Championship. They're not coming back anyway. They don't much care, unlike Duhamel and many of the others. And that's one thing you know Miguel is thinking about right now, too, because if he can finish inside the top three in this thing, obviously he wants to win. But if he finishes anywhere inside the top three, he's coming out of Daytona with a lot of points as the tour heads west. Look at the closing problems. We talked about that earlier. Did you see how quickly Courser closed up on these slower riders here and how difficult it was for him to get on the brakes? Now he's got to follow them through the chicane and then blast on past. Very similar to the problems they have in the 24 hours of Daytona, where you've got cars of many different classes out there, and a 200-mile-an-hour car is closing on a 100-mile-an-hour car, and it makes it real interesting. Absolutely. And the only other rider in that top five that is an AMA regular is Aaron Yates, who is in his first season of AMA Superbike competition, riding the Yoshimura Suzuki, that is one of the AMA Suzukis. So a great run for Aaron Yates. He's only got a one-year contract, too. He might come out of this with a top five finish at Daytona. Not bad. There he is. You bet he started at 12 and has worked his way up to fifth. I think one of the things Aaron had to adjust to getting on this Yosh ride that was really a big deal for him was having to cut off his ponytail and having to shave off his goatee. They said, hey, you're a factory guy now. Got to clean up the act a little bit. Nice kid, great rider. You betcha. Did his ponytail not fit under the helmet? What was I, the problem? I guess not. And here's Tommy Kip. One of the friendliest people you'll meet in the garage area at an AMA National on the Vance and Hines Yamaha. Of course, him and Jamie James will be going at it all season long here as they continue to chase after the AMA crown. And unfortunately, Jamie James already out of this race is Yamaha having some clutch problems. Stay with us. We'll be back with more from Daytona on TNN. Premiering in March, two great movies with two. Welcome back to the Daytona 200 by Arise. Troy Corser continues to lead on the beautiful red Pro Motor Ducati. 
and continuing in the second spot on his go for broke effort here at Daytona, trying to get his fourth win. It's got Russell on the lucky strike, Suzuki. And you know, Ralph, this is a little like a Winston Cup race. It's mid-race. Everything kind of calms down and lays down for just a moment, preparing for the storm at the finish. It is a 200-mile endurance race. However, it is done in 20-lap sprint segments. You got to make the tires last for 20 laps, but you got to make that motorcycle last the whole day. And you don't want to use it up in any of the early segments. You got to have something left for that last 20 lap sprint. Corsair coming right at you. He's got a pretty good lead over Russell right now. He sure does. Scott's not pressing. Of course, we said the number one thing is to keep him in sight. There's Steve Crevier. Former Canadian national champion on the number 14. He is running in fifth place. He's got Doug Chandler right behind him, who is running in sixth, who has made his way over from the Harley Davidson camp to the Muzzy Kawasaki team. And here is the battle for fifth. Two guys we haven't talked maybe enough about it. That is Pascal Picot on the Suzuki and his teammate Aaron Yates. Pascal has two superbike victories in his career. And Aaron Yates, you remember him from the Crawley little 883 Harleys? He had a lot of success here at the Tony. He can find victory lane. He wanted to get on a superbike so bad, did Aaron Yates, that he ran a 750 Supersport bike in an AMA National Superbike race last year. Finished eighth. In fact, last week, the original date for this Daytona 200, it was Aaron Yates atop the podium for the 750 Super Sport machines. Aaron, of course, uh, got a one-year contract out of the Yoshimura team to ride for them this year, but he was also hotly sought after by the Ducati camp. Geraldo Ferracci was trying to woo him away there for a while. You know, I don't think anybody enjoys their visit to Daytona more than Troy Corser. He likes to go out at night, he and his girlfriend, and if he wins this thing, there will be one heck of a party at a place called the Oceanfront, is it right? Uh, that would be the Ocean Deck, yeah. I knew you knew it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. think is one of the things about uh, this Daytona 200. Bike Week in general is a gathering of so many great motorcycle racers. You've got dirt trackers and supercross stars and the great road racers and all of the vintage racing that goes on with it brings out a lot of the legendary riders. And Courser's got a problem. Courser with his hand in the air. Scott Russell blew right past him, kind of waved as he went. Maybe Russell has been right all along. The Ducatis were a grenade that couldn't go 200 miles. If that's the case, Scott Russell is a genius for the way he rode earlier on today because he obviously did not use up his machinery. He didn't panic over the speed of the Ducatis. And now you can see Duhamel closing in on Courser. Maybe, Ralph, earlier you pointed out Courser was looking down at his instrumentation. Huh, he might have spotted something there early. One thing is for sure, Greaves didn't learn anything about letting the fast guys go by on the high side, did he? He pushed him up there again. Yeah, he likes that line. Corser is still on the gas and tucked in, but I don't believe that bike has got the beans it had. He obviously noted something because Troy Corser, as much as he will ride the wheels off of a motorcycle, he is not stupid either. And if he noted something seriously wrong with the bike, he's going to get out of the way. So let's see if he makes his way to pit road as they come past of turns three and four now and do them out right on the back side bike's got a lot of power through there but and look at Corsa. he once again has just freezed that rear stat they call a throttle wide open maybe it's an intermittent problem do a mel though motors right around him well and Corsa didn't go to pit road either and now of course they don't have radio communication with the pits either so it's just up to Troy to decide whether or not he needs to bring that bike down pit road. Dave Sadowski, what's your take on Russell? Guys, I want to show you what a rider has to do to make a superbike work properly. You look at Scott Russell's body English, the sharp, precise movements by his body respond through the handlebars and make the bike go on the racetrack where he wants it to go. As we watch him head into the West End Horseshoe here, I want you to see how precise he pops up from behind the bubble, applies the brake, the transition of weight is smooth. Watch the head turn here. Look to your exit point. Nail the throttle. That's precision riding by the world champion, Scott Russell. 
the one thing that you can see because of all that as he laps past Eric Moe in the 57 is that the bike is not dancing around. Scott has done a great job of finding a nice baseline setup for this Suzuki here at Daytona. The bike is very stable. It is very solid. And Scott is riding extremely smoothly here today. And our producers could not have picked a better man to get inside the head of Scott Russell than Dave Sadowski. They grew up together in Georgia, did a lot of road riding and playing uh, different sports in, uh, as they were growing up as teenagers. Whoa, we got to ride her down. That's John Ashme, the former winner of the Daytona 200 by a ride. Ralph, I think this is going to bring out a full course yellow, something we haven't seen all day. Miguel de Hamel is slowing as are the rest of the bikes on the course. That's going to allow everybody to get right back up to Scott Russell. That also means a pace car here at Daytona because of the size of the racetrack. The pace car is used when the yellow comes out. And especially when you have a rider down on the course like this, it becomes a full course yellow to get the safety crews over to the rider as quickly and easily as they can they can attend to the rider's needs. And you really can't do that with just a single corner yellow. In this situation, uh, Ashby's condition uh, is uh, takes precedent over anything else. So Russell sees a full course yellow. He'll sit up as does Duhamel. They'll look for the pace car now and get picked up behind that. And then they'll follow that around till we're ready to go racing again. So the yellow is out. Stay with us. We're coming back to Daytona. exclusive coverage of the Daytona 200 is brought to you by Honda, the inventor of all-terrain vehicles and the new Foreman 400, the best on earth. The Pontiac Pace Car is out here at Daytona. The Daytona 200 by Arai is under a full course caution as the riders relax a little bit, catch their breath. John Ashmead, we're happy to report the reason for the yellow. The 1989 Daytona 200 by Arai winner is up and okay. So once we regroup things, we'll get back at it. You can see Corsa rides up. He's talking to Russell and to Duhamel. Boy, I'd love to have microphones for that conversation, huh? A little gamesmanship, maybe? Well, Corsa's on his way down pit road. So a little surprised. Uh, whatever is wrong with that bike, it, it must be bad enough to make him come in. This is definitely not a planned stop. The motorcycle off song, intermittently running good and bad. And Corsa, let's see if he just uh, takes it behind the wall or what? Oh, oh he's look hot. at that. He's hot. There is steam coming off of the motorcycle. You know, Ralph, when you said he was looking down, I bet it was the heat gauge he was monitoring, yeah. which would explain why he would slow down to cool the motorcycle. When he got up at the banks, he'd get back on it where he's got a little air cooling going for him. Davide Tardazzi down there uh, taking a look at it, the team manager for the Promoter Ducati team. And that is really going to frustrate Troy Corson. He waits just like Anthony Gobert did all year to come back here. The pace car's pulling off. We're back to green, Steve. And I'm sure there's a big smile on Scott Russell's face, the leader just in front of Miguel Duhamel. He likes Troy Corson, but he hates Ducatis. I'll tell you one thing. I don't think Scott Russell planned on seeing Miguel Duhamel in this position. I think we did, though. We talked about it earlier. Miguel is just a crafty rascal. Russell sits up, uses his body to help break that Suzuki. There is a bump in the chicane as they get set. Look at Russell looking to see who's with him. Right in there, just as you transition back up onto the break, onto the banking, there's a bump. The, the racetrack rolls over. You have to lift just for a hair and then get right back on it to keep that bike stable. You can, in some instances, use that bump to your advantage. If you're absolutely perfect, it'll pitch the bike for you. Russell says, 2ML, go away. Look at Scott looking to see where Miguel is at. Scott Russell, as we told you earlier, came out and ran with every rider he could find that was in the top group. He purposefully placed himself in second place during practice and tried to draft each rider back to the line to see if he can hold them off. What was that last look of Russell? Just a little head bigger looking down at his tire. I think he's checking out the tires a little bit as well, Steve, to see if he's got what he thinks he needs. And here come some of those Yoshimura Suzuki's. Could Russell have a problem? Boy, he is fading. He is dropping. He is sinking like a rock. 
I wonder if the tire got too cold during the pace car laps and maybe it hasn't warmed up to temperature the way he was hoping it would. Colin Edwards is by Pascal Picot running up in second, and it looks like Aaron Yates has gotten past him as well. They sure have. Well, suddenly this race has a whole different complexion. There is Russell, one, two, three, four, back in fifth. Oh, one of the other slower riders is, look out, you might get a karate chop from uh, Colin Edwards. That's Brett Ray on the 76 Kawasaki. Hey, that's Smokey Eunuch. Absolutely, must have locked up the best damn garage in town for the day. Oh, look at the moves going on in there. Colin Edwards sliding by on the Yamaha and then falls back behind him. And Russell, Steve, is not in that type group of four. No, he's not. Aaron Yates on the 21 bike, the Suzuki, in third. They've done a lot of work to the rear end of the Yamaha. Colin Edwards, that bike has a tremendous amount of power. But last year in the World Superbike competition, they had a lot of trouble getting the power to the ground out of that Yamaha. They went to work on it over the wintertime, got it fixed, and Colin says by far it's the best Yamaha he's ever ridden. I'll tell you, the fans rooting for the particular make they own are having a field day right now because virtually every one of them except Ducati is involved in this fray. We saw Scott Russell looking down at his tire. We saw him start to fade. He is now in the pits. Dave Sadowski. Russell in the pits after the two-lap restart. Makes it lap 35. Russell in and out with tires and fuel. Apparently, those tires cooled off, and he didn't like the way they felt. He wanted some new rubber. Ralph, you called that perfectly. Oh, wait a minute. The other day, Scott Russell told you that it takes almost two full laps to get the tire up to temperature. That's right. They did tell us that. But yeah, every now and then, I do get one right. But yes, that is true. It does take about two full laps to get those tires up to proper operating temperatures where the guys can really run it hard into the corners. And Pascal Picot moves his Yoshimura Suzuki up into the front. And there's his teammate, Aaron Yates. They're both going to go by Colin. Oh, boy. I think Aaron Yates is going to be a dark horse contender for the AMA championship this year in the Superbike division. He hasn't had any experience on the Superbikes. It'll be his rookie season, but he's got a really good piece of equipment, and look how he's hanging right there with his teammate. And he qualified very well in the second row. He sure did. Colin Edwards, and here comes Duhamel to make this a quartet for the lead. It's going to be fun to see if Scott Russell can make up for that pit stop. If anybody can, Scott is the man. He's proven that before here. Absolutely. And if it had been any other rider, Steve, I'd have said his day was over. He's just going to be uh, fighting for the best finish he could get somewhere deep in the field. But we've seen it with Scott Russell. Two years ago, he started 64th and won. Came back last year, crashes on the second lap, goes back to 57th or somewhere in that neighborhood, and comes back and wins it again. Yep, Scott Russell is a rider that likes a rabbit. Right now, he's got four of them out there. The power that Colin Edwards has in his Yamaha comes out of the Yamaha Engineering Corporation. It's right from the factory, and it has a much smoother power band to it. It's a lot softer than what the Vance and Hines riders were used to, Jamie James and Tom Kipp. And now, Colin is able to use every bit of that power since they worked on that rear end. Well, we're into the middle portions of it. Stay with us. Daytona 200. Fire ride continues. We're back at Daytona, the 200 by Arai. When we went to commercial, Pascal Bacat was leading, while the 21 bike has pitted back out on the racetrack, trying to head to the front again. Well, Steve, this will begin the process of the second round of pit stops. And the other thing that that does is we've got to wait for all three of these riders to pit. Remember, Scott Russell has already made his second stop, and he did it a lap or two before these riders. He's going to have to try to push it all the way to the finish, and he might come up a little short. And by that little juggle you just saw, I think Aaron Yates, number 20, the leader, he's about ready for some rubber as well. But what poise this limited experience rider has shown here at Daytona. He's leading it. Is it up all the proof you need? In fact, he's running away right now. Here's the battle for second as Miguel goes up a little bit higher than Colin. We've seen a lot of passes in the banking done on the inside. It's the first time we've seen it on the outside. That just shows you how much horsepower that smoking Joe's Honda has of Miguel Duhamel. In fact, he just smoked by Aaron Yates. 
Boy, what a season Miguel had in 1995, winning six AMA Superbike races, the Superbike Championship, and also the 600 Super Sport Championship. But you know, for a lot of the fans, he can't win too much. He's just such a fun guy to watch, not only to ride, but in the pits and on the, on the podium. He's just a hoot. Well, Aaron Yates isn't thinking too much about that number one, is he? He goes right back around him and look at Colin. And three athletes with a lot to prove here. UML wanting to prove it was no fluke winning those six races in the championship last year. Yates trying to prove that he deserves this ride. And Colin Edwards has to go to Europe and say, hey, I'm as good as you heard. I'm an American. We're bad. Everybody running pretty much the same line through the International Horseshoe. And none of them pushing too hard right now. Miguel, a three-time 600 Super Sport champion, and has pretty much dominated that class, even here in Daytona as well. Colin Edwards, a lot of people expecting big things out of him in Europe, as you mentioned, Steve. And that World Superbike Championship fight is going to be a tremendous one with, of course, the Americans Colin Edwards and Mike Hale, Vic Corser and Gobert, and Carl Fogarty making the switch over to the Honda this year. A lot of people waiting to see what him and his teammate Aaron Slight can do. Well, the rain delay, certainly, let's be honest, the crowd is down for this Daytona 200. But go to Europe. Oh, man, do they draw legions of fans. In fact, all you have to do is go to Road America this year and you'll see legions of fans. You see a lot of Harleys. If you'd been down here for Bike Week, boy, it's an amazing week. And, and one of the things that's getting as big as Bike Week is Biketoberfest. When they come back in October, the only thing that's missing then is the Daytona 200. It's truly a weekend of celebrating the motorcycle from the beginning to 1996. I think one of the things that's so great about it is you get to see all the different forms of motorcycle competition during the course of the week. You've supercross and motocross and flat track racing on the dirt and on the asphalt and motorcycle drag racing and all the different divisions of road racing. And you also get to see a lot of the legendary names, people that have won in the past who are no longer in competition, come back and sit around and, and watch the young stars. In fact, getting to hang out with Gary Nixon over the week and talking about how things were when he was racing at Daytona. They were doing 180 miles an hour on motorcycles that were a lot different than these rockets here. Colin Edwards, Aaron Yates, Miguel Duhamel. We'll be back with more of the Daytona 200 by a ride. Stay with us on TNN. We are back at the Daytona 200 by Arai, and we are fixing to have ourselves an all-out war for the three places on the podium later on this afternoon. I'm Steve Evans, along with Ralph Shaheen and Dave Ski Sadowski. And Ralph, how about Colin Edwards, huh? In front of Aaron Yates and Miguel Duhamel. Well, we all certainly expected to see Colin Edwards in the thick of this. Uh, he is one of the best young riders in the world. And of course, Miguel Duhamel, a former winner of the event, no surprise there. The biggest surprise at this late stage in the race is to see Aaron Yates in contention. As I said earlier, we expect him to be strong throughout the AMA Superbike season, not in his first day on a factory ride. No, especially a guy that started with the 883 Harleys. That's usually kind of a sportsman thing, and that's where you stay and you have fun, and it's a low buck. This guy had uh, other aspirations, obviously. Well, and what's really funny is that Aaron Yates grew up following the career of Colin Edwards. They were both former motocross racers, and Colin moved on to the to the road racing, and Aaron kind of kept tabs on what Colin was doing and figured out this road racing thing might be the way to go. So he then has made the transition over to road racing and is apparently doing a fine job just like Colin did. Nice to see somebody use that really cool Harley Davidson 883 series as a springboard. I mean, you can't race much cheaper than that. And Aaron Yates, uh, he used it for what it was created for. Another one of the riders to do that is Sean Higby, who's yep. having a nice day out here today, riding for Araldo Ferracci in his first factory ride in AMA Superbike competition. Scott Russell has worked his way back up to fourth. So going into the pits for some tires proved to be a very wise decision on his part. And that's a decision only he could have made. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? Well, he can't communicate with the crew. They must be Japanese. He's the only one who could have made it. No, what I mean is it's just a matter of time before he got himself all the way back to fourth. Oh, sure. Russell is just that strong, especially here at Daytona. Now the question is, can he get all the way back up to these guys? Because there is quite a gap 
back to him at this point. And not everyone has made that final tire stop. Well, that's exactly right. And that is going to even things back out because if he's in fourth right now, these three still need to pit. Guess what? Scott Russell's going to be the leader here eventually. And one of those who I can imagine will stay out there more than another lap or so is the number one Honda of Miguel Duhamel. Well, Aaron Yates is trying something that Miguel did earlier, and that's a pass for the lead on the outside of the banking. Now, the Yosh bike not quite as powerful as the smoking Joe's Honda. Look at that. Hello. Hello. Splits him like the uprights, goes Miguel. Wow. That, he just saw something fun to do. That was just brute horsepower. Oh, man. Utilizing the draft and all the power in that RC45 Honda. Through the banking, and they're all trying to catch him to get in his draft. But they're having a hard time doing that, aren't they? They sure are. Aaron Yates slides up a little bit high. Oh, and Miguel dies for the pits. So Miguel Duhamel makes his way into the pits, and that leaves Yates and Edwards out. Dave? Miguel Duhamel on the RC45 brings it down to the pit board stop. This is the most crucial part of the race here. They have to make two tire changes, six gallons of fuel with no mistakes. If they make a mistake here, it can cost you at the finish line. And we have got a motorcycle on fire. That is the Harley Davidson of Thomas Wilson. He limping as well. His teammate Chris Carr is out on the racetrack running well. In fact, I believe it's invaded the top 10, but for this particular Harley, its day is done in flames. That is the factory Harley Davidson. It's Steve Scheib in the group. We need to give them a tip of the hat. We haven't had a chance to see them much today, but they have done a tremendous job in bringing that VR1000 into competition and into contention. Chris Carr can hang on to a top 10. That'll be a huge huge victory for them inside their own group. Have we got any superlatives left for Aaron Yates? I think we've used them all up. He deserves them all, too. Absolutely. Well, here's Miguel. And he's right with Scott Russell, and it looks like they're going past uh, Steve DeCamp again. That's the battle for fourth. Boy, that was a tremendous pit stop on the part of the crew, and Miguel did a great job of getting out of the pits in a hurry. Well, the Smoke and Joe's Honda group has been together for quite a while, and, and they're an experienced bunch that has been together for a long time, and there's nothing like a team that stays together to build up unity. Miguel, around, he takes that fourth position away from Russell. Oh, Miguel is on the gas. And they both have caught up to Pascal Picard, who is right in front of them on bike 21. Amazing how aggressive Miguel got with that Honda when the tire was still relatively cold. The number four, it is the number 20 in that meat ball flag. The black flag would be orange circle. That's your leader, the yellow machine with the number one emblazoned on the fairing. Boy, they're going by Pascal like he wasn't even there. They caught right up to him, sailed right past him. And Pascal has pitted for tires. Well, the battle continues here at the Daytona 200 by a ride. Don't go away. We're back at the AMA Daytona 200 by a ride. And there is Miguel de Hamel, who is leading this thing after a flurry of pit stops while we were away. It is now, as Ralph Shaheen called it earlier, a sprint to the checker. Steve, you know, there have only been two Canadians to win the Daytona 200 by a ride. One was Billy Matthews, who did it twice. The other, Miguel Duhamel. Behind Duhamel is Scott Russell on the Suzuki, Pascal Picot, Edwards, and Doug Chandler. Chandler has made his way over to the Kawasaki camp this year where he has won the AMA Superbike Championship before with Rob Muzzy, and he's having a pretty good time over there. Feels real comfortable riding that Kawasaki. He'll be a real strong contender for the AMA title this year. Here we can see the interval, I believe, between Duhamel, the number two bike really in the screen, and Scott Russell, the lucky strike Suzuki. There it is. Down this back stretch, one thing that happens when you tuck up underneath that gas tank, the wind comes up inside the fairing and, at, whoa, look at the wobble out of Duhamel. Did you see that? Absolutely. <laughs> the wind
Ryan, as I was saying, tries to pick the rider up off of the tank, and he gets up underneath his chest. So as they go through the banking, same situation here. You really got to hug down tight on that gas tank. And one thing Scott Russell is regretting right now is some extra time that he's been in the pits. He knows in his own mind he should be well in front of Miguel had that not happened. But look at how the Suzuki closes. Boy, if these two stay like this. <laughs> and you know what? If there is one rider in the field that is not intimidated by Scott Russell, it's the guy in front of him right now, Miguel Duhamel. He's been to the Grand Prix Wars. He's won the Daytona 200 before. He raced with Russell in AMA Superbike competition. Miguel is one of the most confident riders in the field. Not necessarily most confident in Daytona. That's definitely Russell, but most confident in general. The only thing that scares Miguel Duhamel is about a 220-yard par three. That'll be about it. <laughs> exactly right. Lap traffic may be a factor here, as we saw earlier. Some of these riders kind of like to hold uh, their own line, make you pick one around them. Eric Moe is going to be one of those slap riders on the number 57. This is really going to come down to a chess match, and what a chess match it's going to be between these two riders, two of the most savvy riders in the bunch, two of the uh, most significant veterans in the field who have been at it the longest. Look at the sheer horsepower going up on the banking. That's Russell going down low under the lapper. Dohamel just got on the wick a little quicker, possibly. You know, we talked to uh, Scott Russell in the 10th the other day, and we asked him, if it comes down to the last lap, where do you want to be? He said, unless I'm 100 yards ahead, I want to be second coming out of the chicane. Well, he's got his wish. The new Kawasaki Vulcan 1500 Classic, with the biggest V-twin ever to hit the asphalt, you've never felt anything like it. In the closing laps of the Daytona 200 by Arai, the two best motorcycle riders maybe in the world are having their own personal war. Miguel Duhamel, number one, Scott Russell, number four, followed by Picot, Edwards, and Doug Chandler. What happened to Aaron Yates, Ralph Shaheen? Well, we sure figured we would see Aaron in this dogfight in the closing stages of the race the way he was running earlier. However, he was black flagged for passing under the yellow, forced to go into the pits once again. That has set him way back. Still, Aaron Yates had a great day here at Daytona. He should be happy. I don't think so. I think he had an honest chance to win this thing. He wasn't pleased with the AMA's decision, and uh, his membership check may be a little late. Might not even clear. Will Scott Russell be content to sit right there until that final lap and make a move? I don't know. Maybe go up and play with Duham a little bit, try to get the lead back. We know he wants to be in second, but maybe so does Duham L on that last lap. That's right. We might see both these riders slow down a little bit to see if one of them takes the bait and has to pass the other rider. I think our question is about to be answered. Scott Russell told me that he sat back and visualized every possible scenario with every possible rider on a last lap situation here at the Daytona 200 by a ride, getting ready for this race mentally. And he feels he has worked out every conceivable situation, and he knows exactly what to do when it happens. A very analytical young man in the road course sections he appears to be a little bit quicker than Duhamel but I really got to wonder up on the banking if the Honda Power isn't uh, just a skosh better. Well the one thing I've noticed over the last few laps though Steve is that the, the Honda doesn't seem to be as stable as it did earlier it seems to be dancing around a little bit more under Miguel Duhamel. Look how patient Scott Russell is with these other riders around. If it was the last lap, he could have snuck by while Miguel was dealing with the camp and Greaves there. But instead, he was patient, waited, and just sat behind and let Miguel pick his way first. I think he's going to stay right here until the last lap. And that's probably not the last traffic they're going to see either. Pacing in the pits, the Honda crew. It's like your watch is running backwards. That's Gary Mathers of Honda, the team manager, watching everything. Dunlop, which is the tire brand that Miguel is using, has won the Daytona 200 every
every year since 1989. And that is a new twist for Scott Russell as well. He has made the switch from Dunlop to Michelin this year, and they are different in their characteristics and how they handle. So Scott's getting used to these new Michelins. But Russell has also sounded off long and loud about how good he thinks that Michelin is. If he's just posturing there, I believe, Russell doesn't do that unless he believes it. He's not that kind of guy. He's not that big on PR. Miguel won the race, of course, in 1991, and he did finish in the top five again until 93, and he hasn't been there since. Maybe today. Fact. Red lights last longer when you're in a hurry. Fact. It is the shootout at the Daytona Corral. The final laps of the Daytona 200 by a ride a week late, but worth the wait. Miguel Duhamel checks in on his arch enemy rival, Scott Russell, on the Suzuki. Yep, he's still there, Miguel. Don't forget, Scott Russell has an extra eight laps on those Michelin tires. He had to pit early. So those things are a little bit worn down right now. And as we said early on, Steve, what a chess match. These two are playing out at speeds over 180 miles an hour. And eight laps is, uh, what, about 26 miles, the more than it sounds like. We're going to find out just how good of a rider Scott Russell is if he can slide those Michelins around a few more laps. And the other thing is, the speeds are going to come up now, too. Because if they were cruising around a little bit in the last few laps with just a couple of laps to go here, they're going to leave it all out on the table. Believe me on that. And maybe the two most unflappable riders in the entire field. I'm not saying they won't take a chance, even risk injury to win this thing, but uh, it won't be just stupid. It'll be calculated. Look at Russell sitting right behind Duhamel. He closed in, but he didn't show them a wheel. Russell is not going to let Miguel know anything about what he is planning. He's going to close up just close enough so that maybe Miguel can hear him, and he'll let him go. 3.56 miles left. No traffic. A perfect scenario. Remember, the chicane is the key. Getting out of the chicane, getting a good run up onto the banking, and drafting back to the finish line. This infield section, all they want to do is stay close. The lucky strike crew waiting nervously. Well, guys, Russell's been playing cat and mouse with Duhamel for the last four laps. He's edged behind his shoulder at the finish line, not giving Duhamel a look at his hand. Right now, he's trying to maintain the draft, but it looks like Duhamel's going to have to pull out a major dramatic move to keep Scott Russell from drafting past him at the finish line. Well, they each have two aces, but there's a wild card still in the deck, and that's the chicane. And we're about to find out the answer to that card here in just a minute. That's the horsepower we saw with Duhamel's bike all day long, pulling him away. Now let's see how good of a draft Russell gets. And normally, Scott likes to be all the way up to that white wall. And look at how far up to it he gets. Yeah, he'd like to be a little closer to Duhamel than he is right now as they go into the chicane. Boy, they ran it in deep that time, didn't they? Oh, Russell, it's a wonder he stayed on that motorcycle as late as he brake. Now, does Duhamel have the power to win by daylight? I think Scott wanted to be a little bit closer than that, Steve, but the horsepower down the back stretch that Duhamel had helped him out. Scott's poor pit stop is starting to tell, but look at him come. Russell tucked down, as you said, under the paint. All the way to the checkered flag, and it's going to be Miguel Duhamel by a nose. Duhamel changed the line, and that forced Russell to change his line as they came back through the through the trioval area. And Scott Russell just didn't have enough room to run him down. The margin of victory is the two shake hands, one one hundredth of a second, the closest in history, and they're both celebrating as they should. We'll return to talk to Duhamel and Russell. Exclusive coverage of the Daytona 200 is brought to you by Honda, the inventor of all-terrain vehicles and the new Foreman 400, the best on earth. 
I think everybody here still has goosebumps over the finish between Scott Russell and Miguel Duhamel, the closest in the 55-year history of motorcycle racing here at Daytona. Miguel, getting lots of congratulations. Let's go to Dave Sadowski with Scott Russell. Well, Scotty, we saw you sizing him up, staying behind his shoulder so he couldn't get a look at you. It looks like he kicked the afterburner in on the last lap there. Yeah, he got he uh, put a little move up on the bank. I lost a little bit of the toe, just a little bit I needed him. Or, you know, we got second. You'll be back and do it. We got time no. to do another four. Yeah, it was a good race. You know, I'm just happy after the unscheduled stop on that second stop. I was just happy to find myself back leading the thing for a while. I was pretty amazed by that. And then because of the way everybody was running, it was such a, it was a tough race. And uh, second ain't bad. We'll take it. All right, buddy. All right. Ralph Shaheen, take us to the replay of that finish. Al Ludington gave Miguel a tremendous motorcycle to work with here today, and Miguel used it in all of his knowledge. He changed lines on Scott Russell coming through the banking on the last lap, and that forced Scott to lose just a hair, which was all he needed to win his second Daytona 200. Miguel talking with Scott, he said it was just a perfect move to break the draft up enough to keep him from going around at the finish. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was, uh, I was behind him and I had trouble drafting passing him and I want to make sure that I could uh, the only way I figure I could win is to be in front and uh, because I knew the bikes are evenly matched and I said that might throw Scott off and I could see him that he was measuring me up but he couldn't just come by me on the front straight uh, if I would have saw that maybe I would have changed plan again but he couldn't come by me to, by the checker flag as easy I think as he wanted to and on the last lap I mean I just lined that sucky that puppy up coming out of the chicane as straight as I could and I got on it real hard slipped and sliding out of there and uh, went up, came back down, and I think when I went back up towards the wall, he didn't follow me. Hell, I think I wouldn't have followed me, but when I leaned it back in, the bike got into a wicked slide, uh, but at least a 170 miles an hour, 170 miles an hour slide sideways. But uh, I had full confidence in my Don Love tires. That's what they're supposed to do, and they're, they're really uh, predictable. And, and the RC45 from Honda and the Smoke and Joe Racing crew, they just, just did an incredible job, and it's a team effort, and that's why we're here right now. Miguel the Magnificent. Also a terrific battle for the third spot. Colin Edwards ended up there, followed by Picot, Chandler, Crevier, Yates, Kip, Pegram, and Carr on the Harley. Matt Maladin comes home 11th in his first Daytona 200. Randy Rempro comes home 13th. As you take a look through the rest of the field, Steve, what a tremendous Daytona 200 by Arai. I don't think we've ever seen one better. It was definitely worth the wait. Fans plan to be here in 97. It's the best racing in this country on two wheels. It is by far the best best event during all the Speed Weeks events that are held down here at Daytona Beach. I can't wait to see Scott Russell come back and try for number four again. Ralph Shaheen, Dave Sadowski, thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. A promotional consideration has been provided for to be paid by this special offer from Diamond Peace Board.